country lanes. You know, we're not talking active travel, prob probably, but within villages and towns. What can be done in rural areas uh, to make it easier for people to walk and cycle to local amenities and nearby places uh, a, 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 few, a few miles um, away? Um, Ray? Yeah, to make this work, you've got to have uh, a safe um, way, ways of, of, uh, of, of cycling or walking. Uh, we were quite lucky. We got some money from the Transforming Cities Fund, which has enabled us to introduce a lot of new cycleways. I've got to say that's a mixed reaction from the general public um, because a lot of the general public don't understand and they just think we're taking the roads away from them uh, and trying to force them off the road. Um, but we do have to find ways in which we can, uh, um, uh, for shorter journeys, stop using the car. Every time I say that, people say I'm trying to drive them out of the car. I'm not. We're trying to give them alternatives. And that's working now. Chris? Uh, I wouldn't have too much to add there, just the importance of people feeling safe um, when they're making those journeys, and that often involves providing them a separate space, so maybe footpaths alongside roads rather than expecting people to walk or cycle on small country lanes. And Andrew? Yeah, this is an area that our authorities are particularly passionate about. Um, so in terms of, of active travel in rural areas, it's different to an urban area. The challenges are quite different. Um, one of, through our survey, speeding is, is a real issue, pedestrian safety as well. So how do you tackle those, those barriers? Um, alongside an LC whip for everywhere, basically, um, some of the things that we're pushing forward, Mini Hollands, for example, for, for market towns. So in the east, Suffolk are pushing forward a Mini Holland for Woodbridge. That is a transformation of that place uh, to make it easier for people to, to walk and cycle. The, one of the challenges here is that investment in active travel in metropolitan areas is always going to have a better business case than in a rural area. So it's finding the opportunities. Now, in places like the east, tourism is one of those. So we have 140 million day trips, 10 million overnight trips, um, so a huge economy for, for tourism. How can those people that come to, millions of people that come to our region, experience active travel, for example, for the first time, you know, or, or continue that, and then go back to urban areas they, they, they live in to continue that, that shift change. Um, it also provides benefits for, for the communities there. So active travel, looking for the opportunities to fund it, not just through you know, traditional means, but through, through Section 106 tourism opportunities, for example. There's different ways to do it in rural areas, and I think our authorities are, are really up for it. Thank you. Finally, if I may, Chair, um, we, we got some quite, um, and for me as a, as a, London, a Londoner, um, you know, quite shocking evidence about even children trying to go do the school run a few hundred yards get in the car because of the speeding uh, through their, along the lanes and through their villages and often, as you say, no pavements. Do you think the national, um, there should be a review of uh, national speed limits um, on certain kind of rural roads? If I can just say, we've just introduced a, a programme on 20 mile an hour speed limits in certain areas. Um, that is now down to the local parish and town councils to apply for. Uh, so far we've received six applications uh, in the last uh, uh, two months, so we'll see what develops. But yes, I think in, uh, in built up areas, in especially where the schools, uh, we have to start reducing the speed, um, which again will discourage people from using their cars, if I may. And likewise, in London, you have Vision Zero approach. Um, in our transport strategy, we've also adopted in that Vision Zero approach, so addressing speed, but also behaviour. Um, behavior. so vision Zero, not being zero miles an hour, no. but, but zero deaths, zero deaths, zero deaths by, by vehicle. Okay, size by, by vehicle, yeah, that's right. Um, and so it's, it's speeds, um, but it's also um, behaviours, and it's also the design of the road layout as well, yeah. and the vehicles themselves. So it's a, it's a systems approach to road safety. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, for all your uh, answers this morning and uh, offers of further uh, information, very grateful. Uh, so if I could invite uh, our second panel uh, to come forward. Thank you very much.
to our second panel. Uh, for the purposes of our record, could you briefly state your name uh, and your position, please? Uh, start with Mr. Vidler. Graham Vidler, I'm Chief Executive of the Confederation of Passenger Transport. I'm Richard Stevens. I'm the managing, managing director of Go South West, which operates 350 buses across Devon and Cornwall. My bus career started in 1989 in Penzance, and I've pretty much driven or operated every bus service between Bristol and Land's End in the last 30 odd years. Thank you. Mark Hopwood, excuse me, Mark Hopwood, I'm the managing director at Great Western Railway. Great. Thank you uh, very much for your time uh, this morning. Uh, before we get into the, the specific issues of uh, different modes of transport, just uh, looking at the uh, service provision as a whole over the last decade, uh, do you think rural areas, uh, the service has improved, got worse or stayed about the same? I think if I can speak firstly to the national picture in terms of bus services, uh, we've seen two periods in terms of the level of bus, pro bus provision. Mm -hmm. So in the decade leading up to, pan uh, to the pandemic, we saw local authority routes cut by about a half, and that was a response to the difficult funding environment that local authorities were in at the time. Commercial services actually increased slightly over that period. What we've seen since the pandemic started uh, is the, the same pattern in terms of local authority su supported services. They've stayed fairly stable, but the mileage that has been provided on commercial routes has also been reduced. And that's been done through a careful process with operators working with their local authorities to decide where reductions are which need to be made because of the funding pressures the industry's under are made. So we've, we've had Rural, so rural bus services reduced twice over that period, once because of local authority funding, once because of the very profound consequences and changes of the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Yes, I, I mean, I would echo a lot of what Graham's just said. I mean, in my area, I'm blessed with some very proactive local authorities in Devon County Council and Cornwall County Council. Even there, we've seen some reductions in rural bus mileage. Uh, there's no doubt about it, the pandemic has sort of given us a really tough time and the sort of the coming back out of that, we're managing to operate in Cornwall 95% of the contracted network at, as was anticipated pre-COVID, um, whereas in Plymouth we're around 80% and, and the rest of Devon's around 80% of where we would have been. Um, very excited about the national bus strategy. And uh, I think that that sets out an opportunity for all of us and a focus that we can address some of the decline that we've seen in rural areas over the, over the years. So I'm looking forward to exploring your questions as we go through this morning. Thank you. And Mr Hopwood? Yeah, I think over the last decade, which is what you asked about, I mean, the position for Great Western Railway has transformed. And I mean, we've heard... A number of positive references to, to Devon and Cornwall, and we, we enjoy that uh, relationship. But you know, Cornwall has got a half hourly service now on the on the main line, so that's a doubling of doubling of services. Um, all of the branch lines in Devon and Cornwall have got the best timetable they've they've ever had in the in the history of of Great Western uh, Railway, um, and a number of other routes have seen some uh, improvements as well, although I'm sure we'll be uh, quizzed in a moment about, about some in particular. But I think um, we've also taken it a step further because the train's obviously important from our perspective, but actually the integration with other transport's important. So we've rolled out a concept called um, virtual branch lines. And what we're doing now is actually working with people like Richard, but also all the, the bus operators to actually put together a package where uh, the bus service and the train service are much more closely integrated, both in terms of physical interchange, but also things like marketing and information and ticketing. Um, and we've launched the first of those already. We're seeing some great results. We opened a new railway to Oakhampton in Devon, uh, and everyone focused on the trains, which was great. But at the same time, we opened the railway. We also launched a, a new joint bus service which was a, another virtual branch line that plugs not just the people in who can get to the station by walking, but actually brings people in by, by bus. So I think all of those things have, um, 
led to a transformation. I guess my my only nervousness is is the degree of consistency because um, our ability to work is reliant on having local authorities that want to want to engage and actually put their money where their mouth is. And we do see we do see some variations across the patch. Thank you. I think I saw a picture of my predecessor as uh, chair uh, waving off a, a train at. Uh, Oakhampton Station. You seem to enjoy it very much. <laughs> Great. Uh, and we'll, 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 in a moment we'll dig down a little deeper into both uh, buses and rail, but uh, at the more strategic level, Chris, mm. uh, you've got a Yeah, thank you, Chairman. And morning, gentlemen. Good to see you, uh, as always. Um, Richard, I'm going to start with you. Um, the role that central government has to play in terms of um, planning for networks, transport networks in rural areas, um, do you have a view as to whether or not um, the role that the government plays at the moment is adequate or not and whether or not that needs to be more or whether it needs to be less? I think, uh, in my experience, because nobody in the UK outside of travel to education or access to health has a statutory right to access to transport, the role of local government in my life in terms of shaping networks is, is really limited beyond bidding for pots of money. Say I was meaning central government rather than local government. Sorry, central government. I, I meant central government. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry, 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 I meant the government as yeah, opposed to yeah. my local yeah, yeah. government. Sorry. Um, because my life has been literally made up of working very closely with the local authorities, and, <laughs> and that's where the influence around how network development occurs is at, that's where it really takes place. So I don't think that the government has really played an active role in the the involvement of of networks in a pl on a place based approach. I see. Yeah. That 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 place shaping has really come from a much more local government place. And do you have a view as to whether or not the government should properly consider fully integrated bus and rail contracts for a specific area? So I mean I think that there is a lot of regulatory tools available to both local authorities and um, and the government as it stands at the moment. There are places whereby, you know, fully contracted models can work. You know, we've put together the Transport for Cornwall project. It started out as one public transport for Cornwall, started working on it in 2015. As Mark rightly points out, you know, working with the railway, we've managed to do rail integration. We've managed to, you know, keep the bus mileage in Cornwall um, at a pre-pandemic pre level uh, and we've managed to connect most of the communities through the existing you know the existing legislation that's so available would you advocate or not a fully integrated bus and rail contract that the government would let or maybe even the local pa uh, passenger transport uh, I, I don't think I would and the reason I wouldn't is because I think all the tools exist already okay. to achieve the outcomes Brilliant. thank you very much message received mark Good morning. Um, can I ask you the same uh, question in terms of the, your, your view on the role of central government uh, in terms of um, planning and provision for rural areas? And I was going to go on to ask you the same question about the uh, fully integrated uh, model. I guess to keep it simple, it's a slightly tedious answer because I pretty much agree with what, with what Richard has said. I mean, I think we heard in the previous panel about people talking about examples in, in Western Europe about having you know, a requirement to provide transport and of course there is there is no absolute base base position which I think is a is a weakness um, and I think um, we uh, have done a lot of good work and I've offered some examples but it, it's largely been because people have wanted to do that rather than because people people have to do it and I think inevitably there's always a lot of focus on you know structure and legislation um, but I think you've also got to think about the role of um, you know individual people, whether they're in the public or private sector, and the degree of competence and enthusiasm they they bring to this, and you know a lot of what we achieved in Cornwall was down to the the competence and the enthusiasm of a particular official in Cornwall who really wanted to make this uh, to make this happen, and um, came came to Westminster and made sufficient nuisance of himself until things got got approved and, and money was found so I think um, yeah let's 
take the legislative position and the organisation position really importantly, but you've also got to have people who really want to make this happen. I mean, I have just found uh, in my business somebody who is really keen on buses, and some people are, and he owns his own bus, but he's now my integrated transport manager, and he's absolutely committed to sorting out deals with Richard and other people. And I think we've, we've really got to, uh, to focus um, very hard on, on, on that aspect as well and actually providing some leadership uh, to make this happen. I don't think that I support having joint contracts. They may work in some areas. I know they've granted them in places like the Netherlands and certainly you know, my owning group in first groups probably got some competence to to respond to that, but I think the the requirements are, are probably quite different. The competencies are quite different, and as and as Richard says, we've actually got the framework to deliver a lot of the things that people want now. We just need to make sure that we've got the money, the funding, the will, the leadership to make it happen. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, thank you. I think there is a greater role that central government could take in defining the minimum standards that people can expect. Uh, at, at the moment we have a, an absence of that. Uh, there was a rural transport strategy that was consulted on around about 18 months ago. There was also a reference in the national bus strategy to clear a definition of socially and economically necessary services. Yes. Both of those strands of work I think need completion. Uh, I don't think it follows from that that central government should get involved in, for example, designing networks or, or setting contracts. I think the existing relationships that exist between operators and local authorities are the appropriate place to, to take forward the delivery of those minimum standards. Thanks so much. And the, in, the fully integrated um, sort of contract model? That is, so I'd, I'd, include, yes, you're pro or I'd, I'd include that with my, the second part of my answer. I don't think it's necessary for central government so to do that. You're against it. Yes. Yes. Right, thanks very much. Chairman, back to you. Uh, th thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, buses uh, specifically. Mike, you want to lead us off in this yes, uh, section? Yes, um, good morning, gentlemen. I'll start with yourself, Mark. Um, what role do bus operators have in ensuring that um, people in rural communities have adequate public transport? And when it comes to making a decision around the withdrawal of services, is commercial viability the only driver there? Start with yourself. With me? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a train operator, so, um, I mean, we work very closely with bus operators, but I'm not really involved in looking at, 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 at some of those matters. I think, you know, our, our focus on... Uh, working with bus operators has been trying to you know, ma maximise the advantage of, of where they've currently got networks that can be tweaked to serve to serve stations. Um, and you know, our story, fortunately, across most of our patch has been about one of, of of improvement rather than retrenchment. But the issues that the bus operators face uh, in those circumstances, I think I think the bus operators would have to respond to that. You you spoke about good cooperation between. Um yourselves and the local bus operators and you've got that interdependency haven't you so again if there is a decision to withdraw services then that's uh, a channel of communication effective communication you have in the patch yeah i mean one of the things that has happened um and obviously one you know one does have to be careful around things like the the cma provisions but i mentioned a few minutes ago the opening of the railway to oakhampton and that has led to a review both by the bus operators and by Devon Council around the shape of the bus network because actually what they've decided is that some of the bus routes would be better being uh, moved to serve Oakhampton and for passengers to continue to Exeter on the train rather than have all the buses continuing to run into, into Exeter. So I think you know, it is important that we, um, that we do try and look at these things holistically uh, and jointly and um, you know as I say I, I made a specific point earlier of saying that one of the great successes about Oakhampton is not just the fact that we've uh, opened I have to say the only railway line in the country under restoring your your railways but that when we did it we also um, uh, made sure that the bus uh, services uh, were, were improved at the same time. It's a really good question and, and I think you know the answer is that we take into a realm of factors when we're considering network um, design. I mean, 
I'm a busman, I want to run buses. The last thing I want to do is take them out. I want to put them in. I, you know, I want to double the number of buses that are running across Devon and Cornwall, not, not reduce the number. Uh, patently, we have to make a return on our investment. You know, when I mobilised the Cornwall contract, which required uh, 150 buses to be provisioned within nine weeks, my company invested tw over 20 million pounds in, in Euro 6 um, vehicles, compliant vehicles. Um, there's a massive commitment there to what is a rural network. In fact, I need it to succeed, otherwise I won't have a job. So, you know, I mean, we've done some reshaping of the network um, towards the end of last year, and we've managed to keep the lines on the map, but there has to be a creativity around how we make these networks um, function. And as part of that work, it's, um, we've worked really heavily to integrate school transport, statutory school movements into the bus network so that the, the school movement is helping to contribute to give rural connectivity in the off-peak and around those school movements. So all the school contracts, we, we managed to integrate over 120 school contracts into that network, which are now helping to support the bus network. So. The answer to your question is we take into to account a range of factors. Money is one of them, but also how do you in, how do you maintain a network provision? Because it, otherwise it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of cuts if you just go service by service. So it's a network approach to decision making. And, and of course what Richard uh, relates in his experience in the southwest is what's been happening nationally as well. So across the country, bus, op bus operators have been working with local authorities. Specifically, we, we did a program of sustainability reviews last autumn, which looked not just at individual routes, but at the network as a whole, <coughs> not just at commercial viability, but also at the needs and preferences of local communities and local stakeholders. That didn't mean that we could keep every single service going that previously went, far, far from it. The changes which have taken place since the uh, pandemic are so profound that, that we can't do that. But it does mean that we, we took into account, as far as we could, other considerations beyond commercial viability. Another one for me is around the bus operators, the bus service operators grant um, and, and those, those reforms. How, how what is the panel's view of that? I'll start with you <coughs> and then Richard, yes? So did you say start with me, Mike? I, I lost you at that point. Yes. Um, so as we understand the government's plans from the National Bus Strategy, they want to transition bus service operators <coughs> to a per kilometre basis as opposed to a per litre of fuel basis. The immediate impact of that will be to favour uh, bus services which operate in rural areas over bus services which operate in urban areas. Uh, that may well be a transition that government decides they want to make. We are urging them to protect the losers in that transition which will be passengers on urban bus services. The same transition was made in Scotland a, a decade or so ago now, I think. And there would have been very, very profound cuts to urban services at that time, or increases in urban fares, if the Scottish Government hadn't also put in place a dampening mechanism so that the, the losses in urban areas were protected. Very important that we do the same if the Government decides to make the change in England. I mean, the Bus Service Operators Grant is, is an imperative if we're going to protect and grow bus services. I mean, at the moment, We've also got the bus recovery grant uh, discussions that are taking place with the, the DFT um, about the cliff edge that's coming towards us. Good morning and greetings from Exeter outside Saint David Station. Oh, Captain Rail. I was looking up the Captain Rail line. I didn't Live the transport committee. Just, just as you refer to a cliff looking at trains. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that emergency. So, um, yeah, the, the bus recovery grant's due to end in March and those discussions are taking place. We, we need to secure... Uh, an outcome from that and it's being talked about using the bus, bus service operators grant as that as a potential mechanism for for how we might continue to protect and grow uh, the bus services across the UK. Um, I think you know Graham's outlined the potential impact of swapping over from litres to um, a, a kilometres based approach. 
there, there are potential consequences in an urban setting and we need to make sure that they aren't detrimental to others that rely on, on those services. But in a rural setting where there is generally higher mileage services, then there should be an opportunity to actually enhance the provision from, you know, if we get security of funding and the appropriate measures are put in place, then I think the bus service operators grant is a really sophisticated tool to actually help protect services for passengers, but also grow those opportunities in a rural setting. So, you know, it's a, it's a good idea, I think. Thank you. Uh, Graham. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think that you were um, present for the first panel's uh, evidence. Uh, and just to follow up, uh, um, Councillor Bryan's uh, um, comment about trying to encourage people to make a conscious switch um, whether that's for financial reasons, for um, uh, you know, zero carbon target reasons or whatever. W what's the impact of the £2 fare ca cap in terms of encouraging greater bus ridership? Richard? Oh, sorry. Well, he's a bus operator. I'll come to you next, Graham. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, as, as you heard before, it's early days. I mean, we were really, as operators, we were really excited about the scheme. You know, it's good for passengers in as much as it's helping them with the cost of living crisis. Um, in terms of its ability to generate modal shift, it's three months. It's not long enough, in my opinion, to ach achieve modal shift. What's happened in my own company is that it's not actually at this stage growing additional passengers. But we have seen uh, roughly, well, actually roughly, I wrote it down, so if I can find it on the page, it won't be rough. Um, the the take-up of singles sold has risen by 4.1 percentage points. So the actual share uh, of tickets purchased on singles on the £2 fare has increased. But that has been from channel swapping away from weekly and monthly tickets, so people have moved basically to the best value fare. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting to see um, what the legacy is. You know, as operators, we're concerned about the scheme when it gets to its end, because obviously the scheme will end and people will have to go back to the previous fare. So that's going to uh, have an impact. In Cornwall, we were already running the low bus fares pilot, where we received DFT funding to test the hypothesis that... that price is a barrier to modal shift in a rural setting. Uh, that's been running for just over a year now. Uh, we Typically we lowered fares around 30% from what they, they were. Uh, the buying power of that scheme has now been reduced by, by inflation by 25%, but even so, it's generating passenger growth. What was your conclusion from the, from the buyers? Did it encourage modal shift? Oh, it is. Which one are you talking about? The two pound fare or the low fare pilot? The, Sorry, the low fare pilot. The low fare pilot is so. a, is achieving um, passenger growth at the moment. We're looking at fifteen percent year on year, and if you take the in the summer season when tourists visit the southwest, there's another fifteen percent on that. So we're seeing thirty percent in the in the peak summer. Do you, do you take the point that, that that was made in the previous panel? It's not just. The fare, I mean, it's a significant factor. It's reliability. It's a, having a clean bus. Yeah, to have confidence that when you go for the bus in the freezing cold, you're not going to have to wait 55 minutes or an hour and 55 minutes for the next one. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I actually don't think price is the primary barrier to modal shift. You know, if you when I talk to passengers, what they want is all the things you say, reliability, clean bus, punctuality, frequency, it goes where they want it to go. And actually, one of the biggest things that you see happening is that people, particularly those on the English National Concession Scheme, who aren't actually making a payment themselves, it's being made on their behalf through reimbursement, their frustration is around, what's the point in giving me a free bus pass if you don't give me a bus to travel on? So actually, that price barrier element to it, I think... People are happy to pay a contribution for good service, and it's that link about making sure that we are reliable and we are offering good value for money. And I think that the growth out of the Cornwall passengers isn't just attributable to the low fares pilot. It is about connectivity. It is about integration with rail. It is about an interoperable 
multi-operator ticket with no price premium with a standardised product suite and a standardised pricing across all bus operators, that's helping to drive passenger growth. Passenger growth amongst young people, they're the acquirers, that's where we can win the hearts and minds. And actually, you know, I've got 95% of my young people back at pre-COVID levels. So, you know, there is a, a, I've almost forgotten your question now because I'm on one, so I'll probably just <laughs> stop and let you, you re-ask a question. Well, it, 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 essentially, it was about the impact of the £2 fare cap and other initiatives to reduce fares temporarily. Does that have a longer term impact? Uh, and, and are there other factors like having Wi-Fi on the buses, particularly for longer journeys and attracting younger people there? I think, I think the Wi-Fi element actually has dropped out, just to take your last point first. I think because most people have access to it, we, we find that there's less call for Wi-Fi as a provision. There's more call to keep my bus. You know, so you know, it's get the basics right, that helps to work. But we don't have a joined up we don't have a joined up policy that encourages people to modal shift. I've been chasing this for thirty years, it's like the holy grail. Is that not a consequence of the fragmented, or fragmented system we have with private operators? I don't think it is. I mean, you know, people far cleverer than I d designed the, you know, the deregulation of the late 80s. I joined at that point, you know, but better people, better people made, made decisions that are outside of my control. All I tried I to... I think the bus service is far better in London, where it's regulated. No, I don't. I think if you look oh. at the London example at the moment... It is. But it's in decline as well. It's been held up as a beacon, but it's also got its own challenges. And it, it, it also has its back against the wall at the moment. Some of that through pandemic, but some of that was prior to the pandemic. I think they do a really good job through Transport for London. However, that's why we call Transport for Cornwall, Transport for Cornwall. We aspired to match it. I don't think that the regulatory environment of London was a precursor for achieving it in Cornwall. We've done it in Cornwall without a regulatory environment because it's done through partnership. And I heard people earlier on saying, well, we can't get access to commercial information. I work as, with an open book with my local authority. They have access to my information. We just signed a confidentiality agreement. It's really, really straightforward. You know, so they have the access to the same materials. All our planning meetings about services and route changes are all done in the same room. You might have a, a word with your Oppo in Gold North East then about that. <laughs> Graham, can I, can, I, can I ask a similar question to you? And, and there have been other schemes, haven't there? For example, I think in Greater Manchester, there, there was a discounted scheme. And yep. what, was, it, was there a, a positive feedback from that in terms of encouraging model shift? So there, there's a variety of schemes at the moment. There is the national three-month, two-pound fare cap. There are long... It was going to be a year originally, wasn't it? Uh, I, I believe it was, yes, yeah. when uh, Grant Chaps first mooted it. Um, there are also longer-lasting schemes in West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester and Merseyside. Um, it is, it, if we take the, the national fare cap scheme first, the, the primary intention of that is to support people during the cost of living challenges of this winter. It's clearly doing that, and it will particularly be doing that in rural areas where fares tend to be higher because they're longer journeys, so, so people will be benefiting particularly strongly from that. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence yet that that or the other fare schemes are having a material impact on passenger numbers or indeed modal shift. To build on something that, that Richard said, I think the key drivers of bus usage and uh, therefore modal shift are, are clear if you look at years and years of transport focus research, for example. It, is there a bus service at all? How frequent is it? And how quick and reliable is it? That, those are the three things. Price is important, but those are the three things that really drive change. And we will see areas that through the national bus strategy and investment in bus service improvement plans can deliver on all those fronts, and we will see growth in those areas. Fares alone won't do it. Just on, on that same um, idea, it, it, what, what can we learn from what's happened in the pandemic and the application of, I don't know, um, uh, passenger responsive services, you know, new apps, Yep. Are there any things? Are there any schemes that are operating? I think we, I think we looked at one in um, in Liverpool when we were doing the inquiry into um, uh, uh, deregulated bus services outside of London. Are, are there any any positive lessons that the operators are, are, are learning that might 
improve the service yep. to the passenger and I increase uh, 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 bus ridership. Yeah, so the, the, the lesson I'd focus on is actually quite a, a, a dull regulatory one, I'm afraid, and, and it's about the extent to which operators and local authorities have worked in partnership. Uh, and the pandemic has coincided with the creation of enhanced partnerships in, in almost every part of the country. But, but even without that enhanced partnership wrapper, I think that I saw a degree of joint working and acceptance of the joint challenge of getting people where they want to go that probably unprecedented in, in, in decades in the bus industry. I think it's a really helpful development uh, and I think it's something that we can build on for the future. And I, I just add from my perspective, I mean, we, um, we've been working to support the, the £2 bus fare as well. You know, we've had posters, social media, stuff, so it's visible uh, to people using the train. And I, I mentioned the, the virtual branch lines, but I think in answer to your question about what can we, what can we do, well, the work that we've been doing ourselves, that uh, local authorities have done and, and the bus companies, we've seen a 35% increase in patronage of those bus routes and actually if you take the Oakhampton example in isolation because obviously it's a completely new train service as well the figure is 68 percent so I think you know those are quite impressive results and I think you know we'd obviously want to build on that. I, I do think there's a, a lesson about integration and, and joint working I'm just thinking about last Sunday when Sunderland played Middlesbrough at home Sunderland won two nil incidentally Mm -hmm. um, but but, but um, the, the, the train operator Northern put a, 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 an additional uh, train on, which I thought was brilliant, and then decided it wouldn't stop at Horden or see him. So people were getting the bus to the train station, thinking, oh, that'd be marvellous. And then the, 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 there can't have been any discussions about with, with the bus operators about, about you know, uh, integrated passenger movements. And, and it, you know, it just seems... I, I don't know whether those conversations take place on, on, a, on an organised regular basis or if it's just ad hoc. Perhaps it's different in different parts of the country. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously difficult to talk about uh, parts of the, the network that I'm uh, not responsible for. But, I mean, certainly within our patch, you know, we do, have, we do have those conversations, not just with the operators, but also actually with the event organisers um, themselves. I mean, there's a new stadium, as an example, being um, proposed to be built on the north side of Bristol, and one of the key things that we're, we're talking about with Network Rail and the stadium and other transport operators is making sure we've got enough capacity so that, you know, if, a, if there's a, a music concert and it finishes at, you know, half past ten at night and 17,000 people appear, that we can move those people. So I think that I've got examples on my patch of that happening and I think it, it is really important. Is that, is that why you're doing, for, for, for particularly for, for events in, in, in the South West? Do you have a kind of a, I don't know, a gold command discussion with the, well, with it, the bus company? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily use as, as grand a title as that, but we certainly have, you know, high quality conversations, don't we? About, I mean, we've got, um, you know, events in Cornwall, for example, in the summer with um, with boardmasters where we have to adjust adjust the transport plan to, to fit with that and um, you know generally we've been we've been successful of course we'd, we'd always like to do more and I think you know one of the things with um, you know investment in things like new sporting facilities new concert venues it's a bit like new housing it's trying to make sure that the investment uh, in the in the venue is also supported by investment in the in in the transport infrastructure I think I better hand back because Can I of, uh, time. If you make I, I just wanted to take you back to your question about what else have we learned, and I think the other thing that's come out for operators and for local authorities is we've become much smarter around data, mm -hmm. about what we know, and we're much more demand-led than, than perhaps we've ever been in my experience, and that's demand both in terms of the road working environment, so in other words managing congestion and managing capacity and demand for passenger numbers, and uh, you know, as we, as the as the networks leaned down in in during COVID, um, we had to do that very very quickly. And then the escal, you know, the coming back the other way and bringing the networks back as the government support lent in. Um, it was very very important that we looked after key workers. It was very very important that we 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 supported education, access to health, and all those kind of things. And I think the lessons we've learned out there are probably some of the biggest that are going to present a benefit to us going forward as we 
design a better public transport network in the future. I think that we had an intensive learning through the pressure of COVID about how we use that data and share it with the passenger. So on my app, you can see all operators and watch your bus go around and see where it is. I think there's a fault with that because I've, I've tried to use that for the 65 and I think there's a ghost bus that appears to be coming and then never arrives unless it's rerouted. But, you know, just on that data sharing, going back to the old-fashioned method, are there, to go southwest to regular passenger service to ask what they think of the service? You know, when I've asked go northeast, they talk about public consultations. Nobody bothers apart from me and a few other people. I know. But if they, I don't know whether they're frightened to ask the question because I think you get a shock with the response of uh, well, what the passengers think about it. So I mean, we go ahead does and, and go southwest does uh, financially uh, add to the passenger focus surveys that take place. We also do our own surveys. I've got a chatter bus, I call it, which is a community vehicle. We go out and we sit in town centres and villages. Uh, bus shelters and we talk to people about the bus service what we've got the, the the challenges they've got and what we're trying to do and I still drive the buses so that's my best litmus test for hearing what people are saying about buses and bus transport I think the deeper connected you get to it um, the more chance you've got of actually delivering on the needs of, of people rather than doing it to them you've never mentioned the availability of drivers it was something that was brought up previously, uh, you know, how difficult it is sometimes to attract uh, uh, and, and drivers to provide the service, even when the funding's there. I think that has been a challenge, and you know, it certainly was a challenge in my organisation leading up to September, but that's stabilised now. I mean, I had over 100 applicants over the Christmas period. I've got more applicants than I've got vacancies. My organisation is just about a full establishment now, and that is really, really pleasing because we are you know, we are delivering a much more reliable service than, than we were in sort of the autumn of last year. But that, that driver shortage was, you know, had so many component parts to it. It wasn't a simple fix. But we are, you know, I think it's fair to say that the recruitment element of the crisis is coming to an end. The next challenge is how we convert those applicants into new bus drivers. Because I think that the market for existing bus bus drivers has really stabilised and people are sitting tight in their jobs. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Greg, I'll turn to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I want to move us specifically on to rail. Uh, some of the answers that came out in the last set of questions around integration and, and so on, actually, we may have covered some of the ground, but Mark, particularly in terms of the train operating companies, yours and the others, what, what role do you have to ensure that rural communities are adequately provided for? Yeah. I, mean, I guess we've got, we've got some different roles. I mean, first of all, there's uh, whatever's written in our contract um, has to be provided, and you know, there's a base level of, of service provision. So, uh, I mean, we've heard about punctuality and reliability. You know, I think that's tremendously important, and uh, I think we need to deliver what we've said will deliver as part of the base provision. Of course, not everyone likes what the base position is. Uh, so there's then an obligation on us, I think, to engage with um, a variety of people, I mean, local authorities, uh, other uh, you know, sub-national transport groups who were sat here uh, earlier, uh, sometimes, I think, you know, representatives of the, of the business communities and uh, other people who potentially want to... Uh, express a view but also people who potentially have funding and I think we need to then deliver um, the improvements that those people can either fund themselves which in some cases they have or that they're able to persuade central government uh, to fund and um, you know I've given some examples this morning of where we've been doing that and no doubt there are others. Can we switch the focus a little bit then to how the actual adequacy of a service, particularly to rural communities, small market towns, villages, actually be assessed. How how are the how do you go about that analysis of what is the best frequency? How many seats should be available on a particular uh, service? How long should a journey time realistically be from 
a, a small market town, let's say, to the nearest city. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess if we're honest, you know, we, do, we don't start off with a, a blank sheet of paper uh, at each at each timetable. I mean, if we're if we are honest, there is you know a degree of historical inheritance that you know people have got the railway lines, they've got they've got uh, a service. It, it is quite difficult sometimes to restructure timetables in a way that involves having winners and losers because the winners are very happy to take their improvements and people are reluctant to see anything reduce. Um, and actually, you know, some of you you talk, for example, about journey times. I mean, journey times are generally a reflection of the the capability of the infrastructure. So, you know, I mean, I, I was recently in Devon talking to a number of stakeholders who represent people who use the, the line out to, to Barnstable, and, and that journey time is, is around about an hour. That's a lot longer than people would like because we have to stop to collect a single line tokens. So even in 2023, we're still handing drivers pieces of metal from a Victorian signaling system. And we also have to operate the level crossing barriers ourselves with our own staff so the train has to stop and that has to happen and the train proceeds so clearly with investment you could you could reduce the journey time by eliminating eliminating those those tasks i think in terms of capacity i mean to some extent these things are are self-evident you know trains uh, have got busier and busier and uh, certainly if you take what we call the devon metro which which in some cases isn't very metro it's quite rural but services out uh, from Exeter, um, you know, we, we've seen over the last decade just continuous growth. So we've had to keep finding ways of securing more more rolling stock. And what was a, a two-car network is now generally a four-car uh, network. So um, that, that, that work obviously just reflects growing customer demand. And I think we've also got better at understanding where future demand's coming from. So we know where things like housing, uh, are being built. I mean, we've driven some of this demand ourselves, of course, because we're building new stations. Um, you know, and on Great Western, there's more new stations being built than any any other part of the network at the moment. But that that's important. People want to see that. But we've also got to make sure, as we put the the station infrastructure down, that we're supporting that with the with the train service. Do you have incentives in your contract to to meet, not necessarily the obvious running trains but incentives to ensure that the customer experience is where realistic you want it to be that someone turning up at a station has a realistic expectation of being able to sit down on that service rather than stand for an hour or or, or whatever it might be or, or is it just within the scope of you clearly expanding services going from two to four car etc <laughs> just get on with it i mean i think uh, in the current contract there's probably three areas i mean one is that there's uh, part of the the incentive regime that determines what 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 we get paid is around our uh, ability to deliver the train service not just in terms of cancelled trains and punctuality but also the capacity and what we call short formations so if we don't deliver the capacity we're, we're penalized um, secondly, there's a service quality regime which looks uh, at the more general customer experience and are people experiencing uh, a journey um, that, that's in line with what we've set out to do. And then there's also a review of how we're managing the business and how we're engaging with, with other people, which is, is called a measure of good and efficient operator. So if we're not responding to stakeholder uh, feedback, if we're not engaging with people like local authorities and user groups, then we'll get will get penalised there. Okay. Uh, sorry, you wanted to come in, Richard. What? Yeah, yes, I did. I mean, you might think, well, what does a bus person think about the rail question you asked? Well, from 2014 till last year, I was the chair of the Peninsula Rail Task Force in the South West post the Dawlish uh, rail line uh, crashing out. So I have, a, I have a deep interest in this as well from a, a regional connectivity piece. The work that, that Mark and GW are, have done is, is really, really good, and having a doubling of the mainline frequency in Cornwall is great, and I fully support it, so I don't want what I'm about to say come out as a negative, but there were very strong commercial bus flows that were running, connecting some of those towns up, and the provision of the railway is very, very attractive for those people that want to go straight from A to B, but for those that live in the conurbations in between, you still need the buses. But of course, the buses have seen some 
erosion of their passengers because of the opportunity to now s travel on a better railway. So I think in this policy, I think your question was about how do railways help a rural setting mm. and transport. They definitely do. But we do need a holistic approach to it to make sure that how we how we build the Devon Metro, how we do the, the Cornwall branch line projects and everything else like that, that actually we can take the buses with it. So it needs, it, it needs more than an attitude to just what can the bus operators and what can the rail operators do. It needs local authorities to, to really grip their parking policies. It needs the building of new towns and, and estates to really think about access and egress so that we come to a full transport solution that actually does encourage people to use both the bus and the train. And this also goes for demand responsive and hub and spoke that we've heard a lot about today. The problem with hub and spoke and, and this interconnectivity is the time taken. We're all in the business of providing time travel to people. We just want to facilitate their lives to get from where they are to where they want to go. And the more incidents of friction that you put into the system, the less attractive a proposition it is against the car. So I guess the point I'm making is that, back to your question about what can government do, it needs... The na it needs the, the national transport strategies that we've got bringing to life with some cohesion amongst the different policy strands to actually drive some energy into this to achieve modal shift. We won't do it. We won't do it in isolation. Okay, well, I accept that. With, with the the clock ticking, I'm just going to throw in one last question uh, off the back of what you said. This uh, debate between car, rail, bus. Do you think more people would get on the train if the price to park their car at the train station wasn't almost as punitive as the ticket itself? Who wants to take that? Well, I, I mean, I'll pick that. I, I'm not aware of any examples where the, the car park uh, price sits in that uh, area in, um, in my patch. Um, I mean, I think um, generally we've got certainly pre-pandemic actually the problem that we had at most station car parks was that they were they were full actually not that they were acting as a as a disincentive for people to travel i mean the the position has obviously changed a little bit with uh, with the pandemic i mean certainly on my business there has been an awful lot of investment in new car parking over the last decade um, and the expectation of, of dft and government is that if we build that car parking that we we recover the cost through uh, through the revenue uh, line, um, but we we recognise. I mean, ultimately, rail does have to be attractive. But I think certainly pre-pandemic, we were we were seeing very strong levels of growth uh, year on year. But even with the pandemic, again, if if I go back to the Devon Metro, you know, they're now they've recovered all the business they lost in the pandemic. They're above the pandemic levels. There's no evidence uh, that people are being discouraged from coming. Uh, to rail by that. So I think we've, as a group and as a company, we're really interested in mobility hubs and how we bring together the different touch points of the different modes of travel, whether it be walking, cycling, electric cars, go bikes, trains. And I think the work that we've been doing around enhancing that interchange experience, those remove the barriers for the desirability of the train or the bus and so, you know, we've got some money through Transforming Cities uh, in Plymouth in particular to put in mobility hubs with electric bikes and access to railway stations that are less used. So, you know, Devonport is an example on the, the outskirts of Plymouth. You know, that's a very deprived uh, ward within the city. And that, that interchange mode, I think, will, will generate that modal shift. And we're doing that in various settings across Devon and Cornwall. Was there anything you wanted to add on this? Or nothing to add on that specific question. Back to you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm conscious of the clock, um, but I'd just like to conclude with one final question and quick, quick fire answers uh, to it. Uh, we understand the Secretary of State will be making his uh, announcement on the future of uh, rail reform uh, in the Bradshaw lecture in a couple of weeks' time. In terms of your ability to help. Uh, plan for pub public transport to rural areas. What would you hope he would say in that? Well, 
I hope we'll end the uncertainty that the industry's had for, for too long about, about how the industry should be structured and, and how it will work. I think we should look at the best practice that uh, some of which I've tried to offer, other people will have their own examples, and, and maybe the best practice needs to become less optional and uh, more, more mandatory uh, across, across the country. And um, you know there are some clear lessons from how we've delivered success, and I think we should make sure we have the right framework to keep doing that and do more of it. I can't add to that. I no, no, appreciate that. And I don't represent the rail industry either. So. Oh, but we wait with bated breath uh, to see what is said. But can I thank you for your time uh, this morning? It's been a really interesting discussion uh, and uh, highlighted a number of areas I'm sure we'll want to uh, continue discussing in the future. But for now, thank you again. Order, order.